Hello and welcome to a fantastic episode we have ahead of us of Georgie Stripping the Dipping podcast. I'm your unusual co-host F1 Blag and today we have a guest that has won the F1 Constructors Championship and won consecutive titles at Le Mans. So without further ado, Sam Leakes, welcome to the show. Fantastic to have you. Hi, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Brilliant. Well, there's so much to cover and uh, listeners at home are going to sort of hear about your CV and want to, I don't know, invent their own motorsport team so they can hire you. But you seem to have worked basically everywhere and had a lot of success. So really looking forward to, to hearing about that. Yes, um, it's definitely been. Yeah, I think I've had a quite successful 15 years, let's say. Um, obviously, ups and downs as anything, but uh, hmm. yeah, more ups so far. Brilliant. Well, look, why don't we go to the start? And, you know, we often ask our guests when they're sort of starting the podcast, how would you introduce yourself to someone you hadn't met before? What, how would you describe Sam Leakes? Wow, um, that's a very good question. How would <laughs> I describe me? Um, I have, yeah, as I previously said, worked in motorsport for 15 years. I loved sport and cars when I was at school. So that kind of started everything off. My parents were massively into cars and remember sitting on the sofa watching the F1 with my dad on a Sunday morning back in the day. And yeah, I think I always knew I wanted to do something with cars. Although, to be honest, I was more designer you know doing design and things like that um but me in a nutshell I don't know I'm a quite confident in my work but then I can be quite timid in my social life so I sort of have a work Sam and a timid stand at the edge of the room Sam <laughs> um yeah, I don't. That's a good question. That's perfect. No, well, we're not trying to do a job interview because like, I feel no, like you've no, already it's aced good, those. It's no. definitely a good question. <laughs> and um, so I don't age you too much, but when you're sitting on the sofa with your dad, it's a, it's a Sunday morning. Who's who's on the TV in your memory? What's your first sort of big memory of motorsport? Oh, Formula? Jensen Button, probably. Because I remember, I think, I remember going to Silverstone with my dad when I, I couldn't tell you how old I was, but I'm sure it was Jensen's first F1 race and being there and just having general admission tickets. And it was like a whole weekend. We had like three, three Friday, Saturday, Sunday ticket. That's my first memory of, of that side of things. And yeah, being a spectator when I was a kid, you know, although... I was probably not, I say a kid, I was probably a teenager. But yeah, Jensen Button is probably my first real, real memory. Obviously, I've read a lot about it, um, F1, and I've read Frank Williams's book and things like that. But yeah, if I was going to go down that road, it was going to, yeah, it'd be Jensen Button for sure. Which is probably and, uh... an unusual answer, no? Well, it could be. I mean, I'm trying to think in the UK because I got into Formula One maybe the one like a minor era before when Damon Hill was the guy, yeah. but just like after Nigel Mansell. So I feel like there was a progression that goes like Nigel Mansell, Damon Hill. I don't think many people, maybe Scottish people were into Coulthard and we're going to get on yeah, to the drivers I mean, you work with, but you know, I, go on. Yeah, I did some stuff with... David not actually working with him, but I did small things for him, like sticker mm. his helmet and things like that, for want of a better word. Um, <laughs> but he, um, yeah, so I met him many times. But mm. yeah, I don't think, for me, he, for me personally, I, he came later, really. My first real memory is definitely... I have to say Jensen Button, because I remember also mm. having a McLaren fleece jacket that was way too big to, <laughs> for me, and I lived in it for <laughs> probably way too long. That's a fantastic uh, image of a young <laughs> fan that we have there. Um, yes! So <laughs> yeah. You, uh, so you said you were always destined to uh, sort of do something with cars, and... Um, 
I understand that basically not long after graduation, you, you started working for Red Bull. So like, what did you study and how did you end up going from that to, to Red Bull? Well, I studied vehicle design. It wasn't originally my plan was to do product design, but I went for my, I went for an interview at Loughborough as you do and showed my portfolio and they actually suggest, or they actually said that if you can design a car, you can design a product, but you can't do it the other way around. And they actually said about going to Coventry, which is where I went to university. And I actually turned down Loughborough to go to Coventry. So I got an offer at Loughborough and turned them down and yeah, studied vehicle design, which at the time was uh, Coventry was internationally number one for automotive design and, and that side of things. And I was really into art and drawing and things like that. So when I did design technology at school, it was more pen to paper and physically making stuff rather than CAD. But I have to say, it took me quite a while to get my first job in motorsport. I sent so many emails, letters, uh, you name it, in to everything, knowing I wanted to get into cars of some sort, having interviews at Lotus Cars in Norfolk, um, trying to get into even car sales as well. So I wasn't necessarily aiming for motorsport, but it was tough. It was the old, um, you're overqualified, but you don't have enough experience, but how do you get experience <laughs> when, you know, you're what? telling me I'm overqualified, so. <laughs> Yeah, but you got your break at Red Bull. So I mean, uh, what were you doing? What was your first job there? Like, and and what was it like strolling in? Was that in Milton Keynes? I guess it, was that where it, it was. Based? Indeed, it was. I, oh, I was a junior model maker. Was my first role there, which actually went quite well with my university degree because we did um, work in the Myra Tunnel in Nuneaton yeah Nuneaton so we did some like funny little models and things like that and did an aerodynamics course so working in the wind tunnel was quite exciting but it actually took them four months to offer me the job so I thought I had hadn't got it I had gone up there for the interview with my portfolio all smart in a suit but yeah four months later and I, suddenly I was moving to Milton Keynes um wow. First week spent in a ho in a travel lodge, I think, <laughs> if I remember correctly, <laughs> was um, very very basic. But um, my best friend lived there, so it was it was nice to know people up that way. But it was mm. pretty daunting. But it was probably less daunting then than it is now. We, you know, really? they have the big trophy cabinet in their reception mm. and things like that, and that wasn't a thing when I started there. Um, yeah, and yeah. I couldn't, believe, I couldn't believe it, you know. <laughs> no, well, I mean, clearly it's a huge achievement. And, you know, I think, did you join in something like 2008? So just before they started winning all the constructors championships back to back. Yeah. Yeah. So, and Seb's first win in Monza in uh, Toro Rosso. Ah, so yeah. I joined, yeah. That trophy cabinet just, just coincidentally as you arrived. <laughs> <laughs> started to get full so you know you were doing great job uh, making the models for the for the wind tunnel yeah i mean um, obviously it's definitely not just me <laughs> no no <laughs> like no but you know credit, but... we're hyping you up here we're hyping you up <laughs> so like let, let we're going to switch into like a bit of f1 news in a second because there is yeah. um there is a story uh that apparently it could be that three teams have, have um breached the cost cap in 2022 we saw that it was red bull that um breached the cost cap in 2021 and obviously there's a year's delay when the auditors obviously billing their hours take a bit of time to, to yes add everything up um and red bull's penalty for um for breaching the cost cap was a reduction in their wind tunnel testing yes so is that the sort of thing like are they going to have a sort of i don't know uh, a scale model of the car in a wind tunnel, but they're going to have fewer hours to use it. Like what, yeah, how, so, what does that mean? Yeah, go on. So 
when I started, you weren't, you could run 24 seven. So it's normally, don't quote me on this, it's normally wind on time. So you can spend as much time in the tunnel as you want, but the having the wind on, so having the fans working is what takes the time and that's what's monitored because that's when you can calculate all your aero of the car. So you can be doing like a big change that can take, for example, six hours because it's a huge change, but it only runs for half an hour. So over the course of the years that I worked there, we went from almost a one hour wind on time, getting the same amount of points that towards the end was done in 20 minutes. So it's all done. So all the figure, you know, all the point, the arrow points, they managed to cram them into a shorter run. So for sure it would affect them because if I, if I'm correct, if I remember correctly, the CFD side and the wind tunnel side are all included. So when you run a CFD model on the computer, that's also taken out of your time as well. Okay. And that's uh, computational fluid dynamics. Is that right? Yeah. I'm just trying to, so, yeah. <laughs> so because some teams don't have a wind tunnel, well, they didn't used to. I mean, it's been a little while. That um, They use CFD predominantly. Um, and, you know, it would have to affect them as well, right? So it's wind tunnel testing, but CFD is included in that. That makes sense. And um, like, so switching back to, um, and, and yeah, to close that point off, I guess, at time of recording, nobody knows whether there are in the, indeed three teams uh, that may have breached the cost cap and we don't know which teams there are. Everything else is speculation. So um, let's see. Let's see what happens. But um, going back to your time in the actual Red Bull wind tunnel, I could have got this wrong. But isn't it an old like World War Two wind tunnel yeah. that they use? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's incredible actually. So it's um, they used to have Concorde there and developed a lot of Concorde in the tunnel. And there used to be a room like at the very top that had loads of artifacts and uh, old wooden tiny little Concorde model that they used to run. <laughs> in the tunnel but it's it's a it's amazing piece of kit you know it's obviously it's it's su survived such a long period of time and has gone from aircrafts to you know F formula one cars which i guess they relate to each other in many respects so absolutely well i hear that red bull are going to build a sort of state-of-the-art modern one but uh yeah the fact that you know so when were you working there let's say 08 and then for a few years on that's what uh must have been about 70 years 60 years old let's say the wind tunnel at that point that's pretty yeah. impressive right and i think yeah. you wouldn't have known known it apart from you know finding those artifacts let's say okay like the lift that was inside was the very old wooden lift that you didn't want to get trapped in because there was no like exit <laughs> but it was, you know, it evolved with Red Bull over the years because they had to, because they had to keep up with regulations and then obviously car sizes and things like that. So it wasn't, I wouldn't say it was very original on the inside, apart from the working area, which was where you would have your toolbox, for example. Okay, well, that's interesting. Yeah, we, us uh, sort of civilians only see the outside of the building. So it's fascinating to hear uh, that it could evolve with the times inside. Um, and you, so you were with Red Bull for quite some time. You mentioned that you didn't um, work with David Coulthard when he was a driver. He may have just left, I guess, but it would have been the era of uh, Vettel and Weber, right? Yeah, for so Coulthard of... was there for my first. Oh, cool. So I, yeah, yeah I think he was driving. Yeah, could have been. Yeah, now yeah, you're yeah. testing my knowledge, and then I think Mark <laughs> took over the next, the following year. Right. No, because no, I lie. It was Mark and David, wasn't it? And mm. then you know them by first name, obviously. You know. Clearly. Sorry, and then <laughs> Seb came, 2009. So he took over from David. Yeah, that's right. Because he'd 
had his first win in the Toro Rosso and then the following year he came and joined us. And I, if I remember, he was driving an F1 car, but he didn't have the ability to drive in the UK, which we all thought was hilarious because he, you know, he was like super quick, but he wasn't old mm. enough to be able to drive around wow. Milton Keynes. So. <laughs> With all its roundabouts, exactly. If you're from outside of the UK, just look at a map of Milton Keynes. And if you're American and, and, and don't know what a roundabout is, like <laughs> be filled with dread. Uh, come and get a hire car and, and try Milton Keynes. I don't know. Yes. I don't know. Maybe yes. it's not that bad. Um, um, so I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were there for a while. And so I guess, were you there when uh, Vettel left? Because I'm thinking Ricardo would have joined. Yeah, I yeah. was actually. And I was so proud of Seb getting mm. his job at Ferrari. Like the whole team was super proud because we all knew that one day it would happen. Mm. And we'd watched him grow, you know, into this amazing person. And he was an amazing person, not just on the track, but all the time at the factory. He was he was just a very nice, friendly, personable p man. And he still is because I'd bump into him when I was at Sauber and we'd still talk about it. Um, and yeah, and yeah, we were all so proud. I mean, we were sad to lose him, but we all knew that that's what he wanted to do. So it was kind of, hmm. you know, bittersweet, really. Yeah, I can imagine. It's To us, it seemed to happen quite suddenly because I remember it. All, the story was almost about like Fernando Alonso because he got a bit upset. Maybe it was the end of 2014 or something. And then all of a sudden it says, oh, uh, Fernando Alonso has been replaced by Seb Vettel. And then obviously Alonso had to scramble and move to McLaren. Did yeah. you, so did you, you had a kind of longer term inkling that, you know, it was his life, maybe an ambition of his, but how, I, 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 how quickly did you know that it happened? You know, what that he was leaving. Yeah. That suddenly he's kind of not going to be your driver. Yeah. Red Bull were quite good at trying to get um, the factory and you know, that side of thing, people to know before mm. it went out in the media. Oh, that's cool. Um, because they they used to be very good at including everybody. That was one thing that I really enjoyed about that. It didn't matter who you were or what you were. You were made very aware that you were part of that team and part of that, you know, winning car. Um, but I it's hard because I don't really know why we all knew that he was going to go to Ferrari, whether he told us that or we just knew, um, you know, yeah. it's, I'm not know. sure, but he was, mm. yeah, I was, I was super proud of him. I just, it was like Red Bull, he did really well. And then, but then Ferrari, you know, well, he's one step for him. If you compare his time, sort of his peak at Ferrari versus anyone else that isn't, you know, maybe Michael Schumacher. He came, like maybe Alonso in, you know, 2010 or 2012 came close, but like Vettel was leading the championship in 17 and 18 and looked pretty, pretty solid for a while there. So, you know, he had a good go at it and it was during the kind of Mercedes domination. So he did, yeah. you know, it's a good achievement for Vettel. I think so. And I think although he didn't, you know, wasn't as successful as he wanted to be. Oh. I think in a career aim, you know, he always wanted to work for Ferrari and he did it, right? So mm. in that respect, he might not have won many trophies or championships, but he, you know, he achieved what he wanted to achieve. Mm. And I think if you look at his career in general, and okay, he, you know, he went to Aston Martin and he, now he's left. But I think he achieved what he wanted to achieve. Hmm. No, and absolutely. He did it well, yeah. right? So, yeah. so, so here's here's a question for you, right? Because I mean, you've worked in Red Bull, you know what the culture's like. You kind of give an impression that it's an inclusive culture. There's a team spirit. From the outside, you know, not everyone would see that, and we might see, you know, some of Christian Horner's sort of <laughs> politics or or mind games or whatever you want to call it. You know, he's obviously extremely competitive. So, like. And if you look at Vettel, you know, maybe it's because we don't like winners, question mark, when we're not the ones winning. 
his mm -hmm. his kind of reputation seems to have completely changed from the years that he was in uh, Red Bull. You know, his personality seems to have come out since he's sort of retired or went to Aston Martin. What what did what did you feel Red Bull was like? Can you can you recognise that characterization of the team that maybe it's kind of win at all costs, or do you think that's just sort of um, our grapes from from someone like me? I don't know. I think looking at it now, it's very cutthroat. But I don't mm. think you go to Red Bull without knowing that mm. it's a, like this possibility. But it, I wouldn't. When I joined, it was quite a small team, and everybody knew everybody, and everybody mm. said hello to each other in the corridor. And you know, the reception if Thelma knew your name as you walked in and said he hello every morning, and it was yeah. And if we won a race, we had a race debrief and. Everyone was thanked, right from the cleaners, you know, right up to top wow. management. It wasn't, um, you know, you were made very clear that without the cleaners cleaning your workspace, you didn't have a clean workspace to come into in the mornings and, mm. and things like that. So it's wow. <laughs> media is difficult. You know, they at one point they were making Seb out to be this horrible person, but actually he was generally very nice, you know, would. Mm even in his later years, him cleaning the grandstands. But at Red Bull, he would stay and help the boys pack up and things like that. But, you know, the media is yeah. there to cause a ruckus and they do very <laughs> well, right? So <laughs> Yeah. No, they make, they've got a narrative and I suppose they're trying to get eyes on their outlet, whether it's TV or the internet or, or newspapers or whatever. Um, so you were, you were a model maker, so you're working in the wind tunnel. So yeah. to some extent, you were in the same sort of division as Adrian Newey, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, Did you... I mean... Yeah, yeah. go on. As you say, he occasionally, when we, were, we didn't have restricted hours, would ring us up during FP3 on a Saturday morning and say, I want to try this gurney on this part, and we'd have to run it in the tunnel before it went, you know went on the car and they were working hand in hand, you know, he'd wait for us to test it in the tunnel to then say, right, boys, we need this on the car at the track. So. Wow. And a gurney, is that like sticking a bit of, I don't know, something onto the rear wing or something like. You you have to Google it. It's definitely a good <laughs> Google because it's named after the man that invented it. Dan Gurney. So. Yeah. 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 But it's basically, yeah, a bit sticking up to make um how would you describe it something horizontal no vertical on a horizontal surface let's say well we will all <laughs> frantically google uh, gurney now gurney <laughs> <laughs> before we before we move off f1 because you know we need to address your success at le mans and also inquire about penske you you also work for you work for williams after red bull and then latterly you worked at alfa romeo do you have any sort of big memories from from those days um, i mean williams was my first real when i first went racing full time so i'd been testing with red bull because obviously it went hand in hand with model making so it was on a rotation basis that we started testing full size um i did my first race with red bull and decided that for me, model making wasn't quite what I wanted to do anymore. I've always been very hands-on and with rapid prototyping becoming more and more popular, I didn't find, for me, it was challenging enough. So I wanted, and then, yeah, got the opportunity to go to Williams for a season and, yeah, it was a bit of a no-brainer to go and see what that was like full-time. Obviously, less races and I didn't, actually get to do the whole season because of my notice period at Red Bull and having been in the wind tunnel meant that I wasn't allowed to be released early because I'd obviously seen mm. stuff <laughs> for the new car etc yeah. so I mean I probably wouldn't have been able to describe it or draw it but you know it's yeah just protocol good, yeah um, so, but yeah, I just kind of dipped my toe back into the F1 circus, but, um, I'm not, I don't want to say it's not for me or that I'd never go back, but I didn't find it very challenging. Um, 
I say quite often that it's an engineering world F1 and it's very fulfilling as an engineer and challenging but as a mechanical technician I would say repairing or prepare or preparing a car for Le Mans is a bigger achievement because you have to you know it has to last 24 hours and if the car fails on the track you have to be able to know how to repair it or what you need to do um and with a two-hour race i think that's less critical um that's probably just damned my career in f1 ever again (laughs) (laughs) no well you know that could be your opening gambit in an interview you could say you know well i find f1 easy so you know if you want to hire me i can you know make it look extremely easy you, so you, you were at Williams when they had Massa and Bottas and then yes. Alpha, hopefully when they still had Kimi. So you've, you've yes. Kimi kind of been with Antonio. some amazing drivers. Antonio Giovinazzi. Okay, yeah. so you've had some really big names. Yeah, he just career. won Le Mans, didn't he, as well? So it's yeah, really right, it's coming full circle. Yeah, yeah, in a Ferrari, which we'll get on In to. a Ferrari, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> right, who would have thought that? So, um, we okay, let's let's pause on that. We'll come to Le Mans in a second, but on this show we play a game called Taxi Dinner Avoid. And the re- okay. the, the reason I mention the drivers you've um kind of had in your team when you've been racing is because let's do a special edition of Taxi Dinner Avoid, which is you have to drive pick a driver that would drive you to dinner because they're a fantastic driver. You've got to pick a driver that um, you know, you'd have dinner with because they're like interesting character, good, good kind of company. And you've got to pick a driver to avoid because, you know, <laughs> yeah, a bit annoying or whatever, you know. So um, why don't we play the edition, the Sam Leakes edition, which is uh, it can only be a driver for a team that you've worked for during that time. Taxi dinner avoid and no pressure. Right. I'm not trying to damage your career, but, you know, <laughs> taxi dinner avoid. <laughs> if we're going, should we do if we're doing F1? Go on. Yeah. Or, well, I don't mind if you want to do Le Mans as well, but it's up to you, you know. I do I, f1 is a bit easier because there's yeah, cool. less of them <laughs> yeah 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 yeah, yeah. um i'm gonna well, i'm gonna go if i was going in a taxi i'd go with nick de Vries, even though that's controversial now however he's i really like him i've worked with him as a test driver and i was super proud that he got his drive um okay not such great news now but i reckon i'd have a good good conversation with nick in the car on the way to dinner dinner's a no-brainer it would have to be seb because yeah i just he's just great and like i said previously even when i was at salva alfa romeo um i bump into him at the airport and he'd still chat to me you know all these years later and i think that's Hmm. important um avoid would be lance stroll um, I oh, did... He gets quite a lot of avoidance actually on the show. Does he? Odd. Yeah, I don't I did know some why. I testing with Go him on. when he was rather young, <laughs> and I would not say any more on that. <laughs> okay, so Aston Martin is not in your future, I'm guessing, right? But that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's no. why I've never got a job there. When I'm yeah, trying. maybe, maybe. Yeah, you chose, you turned them down, exactly. Okay, <laughs> that's probably the best taxi dinner avoid we've had. It's literally evidenced by real life experience. Um, and you mentioned Nick DeFries. Like, it is a shame, and I don't think he had a fair chance this no. season. I don't think he did particularly badly. That car you know, go back three seasons and Gasly was like unironically getting top tens and sometimes top fives. And that's not the same car that they've got now. So yeah, it's a real shame. No, and I think for me, the biggest thing was the way it was handled. Because I Mm. don't think they said thank you enough to Nick. But, you know, normally there's a big, oh, thanks for doing this, blah, blah, blah. And it just seemed to be, I mean, Danny Rick's a, amazing guy you know really happy that he's back and that's fantastic but to what cost to nick you know i mean yeah that's my that's a bit of f1 i think is very ugly so well there's only 20 seats it's kind of like musical chairs and I'm, yeah. i mean maybe when you were in it it was when they added a few teams there were 26 obviously three teams hopelessly off the pace ish but still, you know, there was more space. And now it's very, it's probably even more cutthroat, right? Yeah, but they did it with Daniel Fiat, didn't they, as well? 
Oh, um, yeah. Well, you know, and he <sighs> just as I was leaving, he joined, but I never mm. actually—I can't say I worked with him. Although yeah. I see him in the pit lane now, and you know, we'll say hello to each other. Um, mm. But yeah, he got kicked just, out for for uh, Max, if I recall. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I missed the Max era. Okay. I had already left <laughs> before the controversy started. So, so he couldn't be in the taxi dinner avoid game. So you, no, you avoid no. reference. Fantastic. Um, yeah, it, it is a shame what happens to drivers when they get cut like that. And, um, you know, I hope that Nick, um, you know, finds finds a new path. I mean, Albon has managed to to do that. Kvyat had another I, chance and did okay as well. So, you know, yeah, I'd like to see Nick back in um, in WEC, I think. He was, mm. I think, hopefully, you know, that's... And he did extremely well in Formula E, didn't he? But I'd like yeah. to see him win well, the one. Mm. So. Yeah, he'd then have a sort of modern triple crown if he somehow won Le Mans or something. Yeah, true. You know? Yeah. That'd be good. Although I guess he has not won a race in F1. But there we are. Let's let's ignore it. Let's skate over my lack of knowledge. It's fine. <laughs> so, um, no, that's fantastic. And it's a good segue. Uh, before we talk about sports cars and Le Mans, if you're listening at home and you've got this far into the episode, please drop us a like if you're on YouTube. Um, give us a rating. Put a comment. And just follow us on our socials. So we're at Strip the Dip on Twitter. The same on Instagram. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're, if you're our 500th follower, maybe there'll be something special uh, for you. But, you know, I can't promise anything. And who knows? Who knows? Uh, George, Georgie's got a big ba- uh, budget. You know, that's how she gets all these fantastic guests. And neither confirm nor deny whether Sam's being paid. To be honest. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, <laughs> checks in the post. So, um, so you left Williams. And at Williams, you've done uh, composites. Um, yes. And you went to LMP2. Is that right? So you were doing Jota. Yeah, and so you got into that's more of a like I won't pretend I know about uh, non single seater cars, right? That is my weak point. Denz is not oh. here; he's going to laugh when he hears this. But you kind of like <laughs> forged a really successful period outside of the single seaters, starting with Jota. So, like, tell us that move. What what prompted you to move? And like, you talked a bit earlier about like it's actually more challenging and a bit more fun, I guess. So, well, what, what was it like? I can't. I think. If you look at my career, I've probably done it a bit backwards. So I sort of started in F1, and a lot of people aim to get to F1. Um, but to be honest, when I left Williams, it happened to be when, was it Mana went um, sideways a little bit? So there was quite a lot of competition looking for jobs. And um, Jota are based down in Kent, which is where I grew up. So my family was down there. And I don't actually know how it came about. I think a recruitment agency put me forward and then Jota approached me directly <laughs> because the fees for recruitment agencies can, <laughs> can be for a small team, because Jota were very small back then, can be quite mm. expensive. Um, I'll probably get people into trouble by saying yeah, that. Yeah, for legal reasons, they approached you directly and it was nothing to do with the email that came. Recruitment agents. <laughs> I, to be honest, I nice. can't remember the ins and outs of what happened. Perfect. I just, it was more because it was down in Kent and my nan was getting older oh. and, you know, and things like that. So I moved down there during the week. I stayed with my nan and then went back to Milton Keynes and the weekends. Um, and yeah, they just got a brand new Orica LMP2 07, which was a new LMP2 at the time for Jota and yeah they were looking for um, someone more permanent as a composites technician there because they knew that it they were going to run two cars and it was going to be a bit more technical it was more aero dependent and you know and things like this so I spent um, a season with them and we were very successful we could have won the championship but unfortunately we had a technical difficulty and um, yeah, and that gave it to Rebellion at the time. But winning Le Mans was, I mean, we made history that year. We were the first LMP2 to ever lead Le Mans and the first LMP2 to be on the overall podium. So it was, yeah, I, I 
had been to Silverstone to watch WEC, but I can't say I was a huge follower. And I'd been to Le Mans a couple of times, but I hadn't followed it like I had F1 as a kid because it's not as accessible yet. I hope it will become more accessible. And you, so you wait a second. How does this work? Was it that the top category uh, had a load of car failures, or like um, yes, there weren't many? Yeah, well, like that's yeah, so, an amazing achievement to be in the overall top three. Yeah. So LMP one was the the top class. Then you had LMP two, and then you had GT. And my friend was the race engineer for at Porsche, <laughs> and. He, I remember we were leading because they had had to go into the garage. I'm not sure what the failure was. I can't remember. But they'd gone into the garage, but they were like five seconds a lap, if not more, quicker than us. And I remember texting him in the, you know, why we were leading, saying, come on, let us, you know, let us win. This will be amazing. And he was like, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, they were just a lot quicker than us. So because they were the top category, right? But uh yeah, it was a huge achievement. Um, Toyota and and whoever else, Audi, I guess, um, had failures. But you're so focused on your race that you don't really follow everything that's going on during the race. So, yeah. And I'm looking at your drive. I've got the Wikipedia up, right? You work for people that have a Wikipedia. So that's like kind of a big deal. <laughs> I, I, the only name I recognize is uh, Alex Brundle. So did you meet yes. him? Like he seems like yeah, a really yeah, nice was, guy, right? He was in the thirty-seven car. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, it, who was he with? He was with David Chang and um, Tristan Gomendy. And in the yeah. other car, which was my car, we, we had Hope in um, Thomas Laurent, who is now like a little brother to me, and we had Ollie Jarvis, who is. Uh, a, uh, an amazing guy you know he keeps in touch with me and we often say hello and hmm. in the pit lane and things like that so it was yeah Alex Brundle you know the name because of obviously his dad right so yeah and his commentary as well I, you know Alex is getting ready uh, yes. to take his dad's job right he's getting good yeah you know? yeah yeah <laughs> but if, if you were um to look at it in a WEC perspective, I would say, mm. you know, Ollie Jarvis was the big name in that team that year. Mm. Um, he was, yeah. He okay. was, how uh, how fast do you need me to be? How many seconds a lap quicker do I need to be? And he'd do it. <laughs> wow. So, That's quite impressive. Um, yeah. So before we jump on to Toyota, and I think, you know, um, you know, we, we can't underestimate the success that Toyota had in the series. Could you break down what composites technician or head of composites, all that, what, what does that person actually do? What are you doing in a 24 hour race, for example? So I would say I am responsible for anything carbon fiber, but predominantly the bodywork and like aero setups and things like that. So if you have a crash and, you know, something's hanging off, it's my responsibility to repair that and have bits ready to change it, et cetera. Um, when I first started, there was a lot more aero allowances. Um, so you could change flap angles during the race and, and things like that. So you could prepare spares to have a different um, aerodynamic performance so they could pit stop, change, and then carry on. Mm. So I always say, yeah, I'm respo responsible for anything carbon fiber. If it breaks, it's up to me to understand why and repair it appropriately and get the car back on track. So, yeah. Amazing. Well, um, my co-host who isn't here today, Dens, he does a bit of sim racing. Uh, okay. And, you know, I always take a shot at him. So I'm this is the shot of the episode. He likes to crash. And then, yeah, I mean, you know, he loves barriers. It's one of his favorite pastimes. And uh, I, I mean, I can't talk. I don't know how to do sim racing. But anyway, it's fine. I can, from my armchair, I can take the mic. So um, <laughs> they, they always have like, um, you know, crash damage. It takes time. You have to go into the pits and then it literally feels like it's taking like six minutes, 20 minutes, whatever to fix it. So in a race, how long, a 24-hour race, like how long does this stuff take to 
you know, in the worst case scenario, how long could you be trying to fix something in the pit? You could be in there for an hour or two. Wow. Thing is with Le Mans, you don't know what will happen to other people. So you're constantly chasing. So you could be in the um, garage for an hour and 13 minutes. And then, you know, four hours later, someone's in the garage for an hour and 14 minutes. You know, you're, it's that tight. And, and you just don't know. People can, I've seen people go into the garage and spend, you know, hours and hours and hours trying to sort the car out, getting it out just to do the final lap to say, you know, they finished Le Mans. So it's. Yeah, that makes sense. It's a good, that's why I like it because mm. you can be in the garage for a, a long period of time, but you can still go out, finish Le Mans and even win it. So. Yeah. I think there is something funny in Formula One that's happened more recently where like, you know, if you're racing for position, but the car overtaking you is much faster, you'll be like, yeah, yeah, I'll just let them through, whatever. Or like, you know, ah, oh, mm, yeah, we better retire the car. And 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 obviously they've got like very limited um, numbers of spares that they're allowed or, you know, component yeah. parts are allowed to run in a season without penalty. In this feels almost like, you know, Le Mans and endurance, like almost pure, pure racing. People want to get back out on track no matter what. You know? Yeah. And I think, it's more budget dependent in mm. WEC. You know, you try and have as many spares as you can, but if you crash five times, you you know, you're going to be without. And that would be then somewhere where I'd have to step in to try and make some things that could go back on. So in Le Mans, for example, my job, if we crash, is extremely busy because we might have three spares, but we might need a fourth. So, mm. you know, your your mindset is very different to a four-hour race, a two-hour race, or a six-hour race because mm. you can come in and change what, what you need to. And, yeah, you can't do that in a sprint race, for example, you know? No, that makes sense. So you um you kind of jump into a new or, or kind of a small, let's say, British team based in Kent, um, and then, you know, within a year, you're at Toyota, who are, you know, the class of the field back back then. Um, that's a big that's a big step up, right? I mean, you then continue to win Le Mans, but like, what was your role there? Was it similar? And like, what was the experience like? Did the experience change moving to kind of a big manufacturer? So they saw me in the pit lane. Um, being a female doing what I do, there's not many of me. And there's actually not many composites technicians anyway, compared to like mm. mechanics and engineers. And yeah, they had a role available and they contacted me, which was, you know, it was based in Germany. And when I was younger, I'd always wanted to go to Germany because I had family out there, distant family, but I had family out there. And it would have been stupid to say no you know they got to live in germany <laughs> another country and experience something different um culturally it was a lot different to what i was expecting um you don't realize the differences until you go and actually live somewhere i mean you have all the stereotypes and things like that and yeah i mean stereotypes are there for a reason but it was, I think, because I'd already worked at big teams, Jota was probably more of a shock than going to Toyota. Because Toyota run, having been in F1 um, many moons ago, still run or ran their workshop factory in a very similar way. So I would say in that respect, it was probably easier than going to a small team like Jota, where I, you know, went in to help set up and sort things out with a tight budget that I wasn't used to, let's say. Mm. So more, I would say, the fact that I moved to Germany was challenging than actually Toyota themselves. Yeah, where, where in Germany was it, you know? So they're based in Cologne. Okay. Which All is right. a very lovely place and very good Christmas markets, if anyone so wants to go. So I hear. 
<laughs> but you came home for Christmas, surely, right? They didn't force uh, you to work through Christmas, or you no, just... no, no. Um, <laughs> uh, obviously, you had to take holiday. It was very much like working anywhere, really, because you were full time. I wasn't a contractor or anything like that. So, yeah. And yeah, um, so, so did was your job different? Were you a no, part of a composite the, team or the same the or same. like? Yeah. It was the same as at Jota and the same as at you know uh, Williams. So they all kind mm. of go hand in hand. I mean, even model making, the natural um, progression is, or for me, is composites. And I know a lot of people who have done a similar path. Um, but yeah, it's very much the same. Okay, just on very different components. You know, you've got headlights and <laughs> and. Yeah glitters and things like that and you know elephant's feet which is you know you're gonna have to explain very... what that is elephant's feet go on so you see you have a <laughs> i don't know why it's called an elephant's feet i think it came from orica someone obviously decided it looked like one at some point you have lots of random things in motorsport that have odd names because an air has designed it and given it an odd name but it basically um had the number panel in so and what we call the leader lights, which are three lights to say whether you're first, second or third or none, if you're not in those positions. And then your number panel, which is the number of your car. So that lights up at night and it's visible for everybody to see. And some of them also have the wing mirrors in. That makes sense. And um, when you were there, so Toyota were basically unbeatable, right? Or at least... Uh you know, reliability, you know, like I, I, I vaguely recall, most... go on, go on, go no. on. I think they had the most experience at the time. Ah, uh, okay. And what, so, so what, what series is this? This is LMPH, right? This Am I, I'm LMP1. just. LMP1, right. See, I don't even know what the names are. And what, dri... <laughs> Did, didn't you have some big name drivers? Like, didn't you have some big. Yeah, Boy Me, in... Sebastian Boy yeah. Me. Yeah. yeah. Um, now that uh, Brendan Hartley, so some F1 Oof. guys, uh, Kobayashi, yeah, yeah. Nakajima, okay. mm -hmm. uh, obviously, uh, Lopez and Mike Conway, and but you know, yeah. if you get me down, down the F1 route, I guess Brian didn't, did, uh, didn't Alonso join them, for yes, a bit, or I, I made that obviously, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah Alonso. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but there. you know he's a small, small name in, in the <laughs> in the context of the career you've had. You know he's just a That's small. terrible. Yeah, no, only I two know. world championships. I mean, come on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, I think he needed to leave F one. I, I don't know if yeah. how much you follow like drivers that have done it for a long time. And Mike, um, Mark was a bit the same. They sort of get a bit. Well, we have a word uh, saying Chernobyl lemon, which is bitter and twisted. Um, Wow. And I think, <laughs> and I think you know, you spend too long doing something, you need a break to find yourself again. And I think Alonso needed that break to, because I think he was getting pretty frustrated with F one life. That he came back to, he came to work, and you know, it's very different. It's very different for the drivers. It was a new challenge, and then he's come back to F one as strong as he was in the beginning right so mm, no, that makes sense and um and so you left toyota and you went to alpha we've talked a bit about that yeah my... but i i could see here that you went to penske is that like the I... american penske or is that like some formula e penske what penske are we talking about here so they are now in WEC, and they were are were are, are doing a collaboration with porsche so they've designed a new LMDH, which is a Le Mans hybrid car. So with a hybrid system in, and they designed that alongside, well, Porsche designed it, and then Penske are running it. So it's a bit of a collab. Um, they were setting up a team in Germany. Um, and I helped to homologate the car. So I was involved in all the wind tunnel testing and then a lot of the aero tests, full size testing and, and things like that. Um, yeah, but it's based, it's run by Team Penske America. So the NASCAR slash IndyCar group, it's the same. 
but they have a little team now in Mannheim in Germany. Wow. Okay. So more time in Germany. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. So I went to Switzerland to work at Alfa Romeo. As you uh, do, you know, just go over the Alps. Just go, just go down. There. It was. I actually drove there for my interview and got a speeding fine. <laughs> well, that's par for the course. You should get a speeding fine if you want to be a motorsport. I mean, no, kids do not no, speed. Switzerland, but, you know. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Switzerland is notoriously bad for cameras on bends that right the uk for example would not have for safety reasons i you see know, i see we're going break on a corner for example yeah but um, yeah the swiss <laughs> are known for a good fine but yeah yeah so i left um alpha i did a season with them and yeah decided it wasn't really I didn't, I don't know, it's a lot of races and it's mm. a lot of time away and, you know, you'll never really, you never really get five minutes to yourself. So, you know, your bags, all, your suitcase is packed all the time. You do the washing, you put it back in the suitcase, you go, you know, that's, mm. and I think for me, I needed a bit of a better life work balance and it's, hard to accept that now <laughs> because i find it bizarre having more of a life <laughs> if that makes sense i don't know what to do with myself yeah exactly right what are you going to do with all that time um, yeah i just realized because we didn't really like contextualize all these moves in around covid because clearly oh, yeah. you were with toyota for the start of covid by the looks of it and then like even going to um uh salva or alpha like that would have yeah. been just as things were opening up or the year after like did that yeah, affect so, your experience you know yeah so i had towards the end of the my time at toyota i struggled with some various things and covid hit quite hard because i was in germany and i was still working so we just went on to shifts but everyone in like other countries were on proper lockdown weren't allowed to leave you know leave their flats or it was a lovely homes. time we all got to watch yeah, a lot of netflix me. yeah sorry yeah, i was still working it was almost normal for me and it played quite heavily mentally on me um to think well this is this is ridiculous you know i'm you know people are going out and clapping for the nhs and i'm you know i feel i felt extremely guilty to just be having a slightly less normal life you know um because germany handled it very differently each state and you know it was i struggled with that and i thought that i was going to go back to the uk um so i handed my notice in with no real plan at toyota at the end of you know well i gave them six months i gave them a bit extra notice um with the view that I'd finished the year, whatever that year would be. And yeah, finished a, I think around, well, finished at Christmas. And then obviously COVID hadn't really left, but I had, I got approached. I put a post on LinkedIn saying I'm available, you know, what's going on. And the technical director at Salba approached me and said, oh, we think, you know, there's a position here. We think you, you know, you'd be good to help us improve things. And yeah, so, and actually, in reality, it was the most stable motorsport championship at the time. Yeah. You knew you were going to go racing, right? There was all the, they had the money to facilitate COVID um preparations operations yeah uh, yeah precautions i don't know yeah precautions, all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, 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 so yeah 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 i would have been daft to say no because maybe i would have done you know less racing than i did but yeah it was and it, i think it was good to be in f1 at, at that time because you were looked after because they had to right you know if you were going to travel around the world they couldn't afford for you to get sick so no and i guess like the knock-on impact if they have lots and lots of people getting sick in the paddock then you've got you know it's visible i suppose and when drivers start getting knocked out it starts to affect 
oh god should we continue you know so i guess yeah they had to keep you safe and it must have been a very surreal time traveling the world when you know covid i guess it, it was sort of the year after the big covid lockdown but still it was not normal and we'd all have to have vaccines and all that sort of stuff yeah. you know i think is that, um, is that an odd one yeah i think le mans was the the worst the worst the, the strangest the weirdest yeah. because we ran we did le mans with absolutely no yeah. spectators and that's that wow. was and because it was such a long race that made it even longer <laughs> Because you had nothing, you know. What were you racing for? And that's, you know, it made everyone question that. It made people realise that, you know, we're we're providing entertainment, right? And we were Absolutely. going round and round for twenty four hours, and people, I think, could join on YouTube. I can't remember, but it was very. <laughs> that was the biggest shock, I think, when it sort of hit home. Was Le Mans twenty twenty? Because it was also in September. Yeah, I think they, because yeah. lots of things that were meant to be in sort of May, June, etc. They were just like, look, they're cancelled. And then I guess they had to reconvene and work yeah. out when to do it. Yeah. Yeah, so Absolutely. that was very bizarre, not having any cheering and... No. Yeah. No one getting in the way in the pit lane, in the paddock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you love that, right? Yeah, all these people. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah well right they, they're the paying punters they're the i guess they're oh, yeah. part of the reason why the teams have the money to deliver because people tune in and watch it and then that drives uh you know advertising revenue and so on and so forth so yeah so yeah, yeah. but they also need to have a car to watch so yes yeah absolutely if you're getting in the way <laughs> <laughs> well, i see i see <laughs> yeah i'm on the different side of that then because <laughs> There's been many, especially when Alonso, when we were at Silverstone, like there was paddock access and we were trying to get parts to the car and people were getting in the way because, and you know, getting angry at us. And we were like, yeah, but, you, you know, you do know he needs a car to drive. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's, that, I mean, that's just frustration because we're, we're working and people, you know, the people aren't, don't realise that, you know, we've got tight deadlines to meet and stuff like that so no uh, understandable so look sam before we hear a bit more about what you're up to now because i think you're freelance one more game which is you've talked about all these you just mentioned silverstone but like you've traveled around the world you've been in multiple series if you could pick one car for a hot lap around one track oh what do you think you'd pick oh that's i would pick the nordschleife because it's obviously the most epic track ever and it's well, long so you get yeah, exactly right you get longer right? i don't know what car i choose that's a good question you twice you've got me on that one yeah see right yeah <laughs> we asked the real questions <laughs> <laughs> I honestly i really don't know because yeah it's difficult hmm Hmm. Well, have a think about it. Maybe you yeah, can reply what... on Twitter and tell us, like, <laughs> a week later. Do you know I what? A, a sudden yeah. like, it's a Ford <laughs> Transit van. That's the car I want. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, don't, I would love to have a a VW Caddy, um, no, yeah, split screen with a Porsche engine in, but I'm not sure I'd want to go around the Nordschleife with that. <laughs> this is the level of specificity. You're, like, you, you're thinking of tailoring the car to the track, and that's not... I don't have that sophistication, so you know. <laughs> I was like, "What's so hard?" You know, you just want like a Formula One car around the North Schleifer, right? There'd be no problem there. Obviously, there would be. Uh, okay, well, um, let us know. So we're gonna this episode will go out on Saturday. So you've got you've got like a few days to think about it. No pressure. I'll try. Uh, I'll try to. Yeah, you might. I might. <laughs> do some homework. I'll lose out on sleep now. What am I gonna do? No, no, no. <laughs> Oh dear. Horse right. and carriage. There you go. That would be horse and carriage. That'd make it even longer. See, that's smart. I didn't say it had to be a motorized car. It's a horse drawn one. So there you go. Smart. You got it. You got us. Right. You're always thinking, right? I, th I feel like you'd be a difficult opponent, you know, with oh, your maybe. Team. Yeah, right. Exactly. So um 2023 is where we are. Um, and I think you've gone have you gone freelance? Like, so I what have. are you 
what are you doing with all this time? I mean, working as well. well but play, yeah, what are you up to? <laughs> you can play Brexit for a lot of it, unfortunately. Um, Oof, politics. Yeah. It, people, this is very um, serious statement. People didn't realise how it was going to affect people that were already leaving out of the UK. And it, because obviously I left Germany, I went to Switzerland, I went back to Germany, and now I'm in France, you know, it, it's tough now. You have to have visas and they have to, you have to persuade them why you're better than the person of that country. You know, you're, for want of a better comparison, it's almost like you've come from China. Um, you know, it's difficult now. And the freedom of movement was amazing. You know, I just one day decided I was going to work in Germany, you know, and that was incredible. Okay, there was paperwork, but. But yeah, so now I'm trying freelance because I have a lot of, in WEC particularly, there is a lot of freelance, so sport cars, sport cars, sports cars, there is um, a lot of opportunity to do that. So a lot of weekend warrioring, as we call it, um, where you just turn up to the racetrack and do what you need to do um, for budget friendly reasons. And I... A friend left, so I'm working for two different teams this year. Um, one that's based at Paul Ricard, so locally to me where I live, because I live not far from there. And then a, a British team. And my friend worked with them last year and um, decided to go to a bigger team who was doing a wider variety of championships. And he put me forward for to take over his position and yeah um i'm giving it a go let's say so i'm working for two teams one team um idex sport who run in elms and the michelin le mans cup but i mostly do their factory turnaround so after a race or a test i do all their repairs at the workshop and then gr racing who i do world endurance with so yeah, it's different. <laughs> yes, so, but two teams, like, does that mean basically if one one championship's got a weekend off, you're doing the other one? Like, how do you, is, are you busier <laughs> now or how does it work? At the moment, I'm not because the ELMS team have a guy already um, who's doing their races. So you normally get, you get signed up, you get approached towards the end of the year, beginning of the year. Um I obviously had GR around Christmas time, I think, maybe a bit later. Um, but I didn't really know how it would work for me in terms of setting up, basing myself in France. Because um, I wanted to go full hog France rather than there's a bit of a grey area, let's say, these days between, with, between working in the EU and being in a Brit. Um so, actually, with the indexing, I thought, okay, well, WEX is going to be great, but it's only eight, seven, eight races, which, okay, is quite a lot, but it's not masses uh, throughout the year, and I wasn't really sure how it would work. And so I approached IDEC on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is my, if anyone wants a website to use to get jobs and stuff I have to say LinkedIn has been my success point of that side of things um I think I should get paid for saying that <laughs> no well the fact that you said earlier yeah I just posted on LinkedIn and then the technical director of Salva gave me a call you know just like did you know this person before are you just a big deal in the paddock and we just didn't realize like how, how I'm going to write on LinkedIn after this, like just writing like, oh, yes, I'm happy to take more money, please, and see if anyone takes me up on it. Who knows? I don't know. I don't, um, in terms of like WEC, I pride myself in having a good reputation. Um, it's one thing I want to have and I try to be fairly visible. I know like if Sarah's listening, who is this? Uh, assistant team manager at GR she'll she'll laugh at this but I kind of know someone in every team in the pit lane in WEC slash Le Mans because Le Mans is a bit of an amalgamation of LMS and WEC um, and I kind of 
I like that because it means, you know, if I ever need a job or if I'm ever in trouble, so we've had a crash and I need something that I don't have, you have that relationship with everybody and everyone in that pit lane wants to race. You know, there's no point having only one car going around. They'd rather help another car. So there's a bit of competition, which is what I like about the WEC pit lane. You know, even your rivals will help you to a certain degree. Um, And, yeah, I wouldn't say I'm a big deal. I'm just quite well known. Is that very big headed to say that? Well, no, and I, I, you definitely didn't say you were a big deal. I was just uh, pretending that you'd said that. No, not at all. Yeah, no, no. I, yeah, I wouldn't <laughs> say that. It's not my style. <laughs> no, no, no. But uh, um, I don't know about the technical director. It's, I think LinkedIn is a really good tool, um, especially, you know, when you are, yeah. People share, if you're looking for a job and you put, I'm looking for a job, is there anything out there? And you've got people, you know, quite a large network. For me, so far, it's, I would say almost most of my jobs through my career have been through LinkedIn. Oh, you definitely should get um, paid for that. That's like an ad read (laughs) for LinkedIn, you know? Yeah. (laughs) This podcast was brought to you by LinkedIn. If you don't, if you don't use <laughs> it every <laughs> single day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. Well, um, everyone's going to go and find your LinkedIn and now pretend to offer you jobs. But um, <laughs> it sounds like it sounds like you're kind of adjusting to probably working a normal amount, like a human amount of hours that we're all used to working, and you're probably used to working double. Um, yeah. There we are. Yeah. yeah, it's odd. Like next week, I have no work or no work planned so far. We'll see how mm. this week goes. And then it's like, well, what do I do now? But it's nice, actually, because I haven't really, since I got into motorsport, I haven't really had that, you know. It's been full attack and devoted my life to it. That now it's like, oh, well, I can go for a walk if I want, or I can go and ride my bike if I want, or go to the shop, you know. It's, uh, yeah, a very surreal yeah. feeling. Yeah, and you've got the whole of France to explore. You know, who knows? Yes, where you, where right. you can go. so big, so, so. <laughs> it might take me a while, but, you know. Yeah, it's not, yeah, doing a lap of that. Well, I think they call that the Tour de France, do they? But there we, don't they? But there we are. So, <laughs> I um, don't even say the whole France. No, not quite, not quite. Um, yeah, it started in England once. I don't know how that worked. Yes, it did, because it went past my where I went to school. Yeah, I right. That. Exactly. So, um, before we sign off... Um, what's your kind of future aspiration? Like, do you have anything that you want to tick off that, that you haven't done or anything you'd like to do again? What, where, where do you want to go? I would like to do the Daytona 24. That's my big next one. Um, and I'd probably like to do the Indy 500 to say, I've been to the Indy 500, but I've not worked it. And I'd like to have my triple crown because I've done, I've worked Monaco, I've worked Le Mans. I'd like to work the Indy 500 just to tick it off. But Daytona 24 hours, I think, is my aim and a realistic aim, let's say. So, yeah, that's... that's That sounds like a rumour that you're going to get a job working in IMSA. No, no, I'm just... The IMSA WeatherTech Series or whatever it's called. (laughs) And put my... (laughs) Put a post out. (laughs) exactly right i'm going to be watching this linkedin now like we're all going to follow you and just follow the dream you know it's a new social media sort of story fantastic well good luck um i think we're all rooting for you now we adopt people on this show you're definitely our composite um head of composite for the show there we are oh thanks (laughs) yeah we'll give you some stickers with pride you can secretly put our podcast sticker on a bumper. I'm sure that it's like a sackable offence or something. But oh, there I we don't, don't, don't know. Do I do that. You send okay. me a sticker. I'll get it somewhere. All Sarah, right, Georgie, you've heard that. I Come won't. on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's evidence now that you've committed to doing it. If it happens, it was an accident. And uh, yeah, that's, yeah, brilliant. I do love well, a sticker, so I wouldn't say no to that challenge. That would be quite amusing. Okay, right. No, you're on, you're on. We're going to do it. Okay, so um, before we go, we always ask uh, every list, uh, every uh, member or participant on the show a really important, very technical question. 
Not so the right. setup question is right. Yeah, exactly right. Don't worry, <laughs> it's really, really difficult. So the setup question is: Do you like pizza? Do I like pizza? Depends yeah, what type. Do you like of pizza. it? Right. Perfect. Right. So, okay, this is the critical question, right? Pineapple uh, on pizza? Yes or no? Uh, in Italy, no. Boom. But if I was making, oh no, because even if I make my own pizza these days, I don't. But I don't mind a Hawaiian pizza. Oh, uh, oh dear. We had. You, I thought you were a woman of taste, and it's just sort of all gone down. <laughs> I am. I am being too polite. To oh, <laughs> Georgie is going to be happy. She is the pineapple team, and I'm the sort of non-pineapple. Me and Mario Andretti are on the same team. Okay, <laughs> he, he confirmed that. But you must not have a pineapple on a pizza. But there we are. Georgie, well, I wouldn't congrats. put a whole one on. I'd yeah, not you know with with the green bit on it. Yeah, that'd be ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, what? What? what are we doing? Yeah. It's no longer a pizza if you do that. Right. Uh, well, you know, that's a bombshell on which to end it. Where can people find you on uh, on social media? Um, Instagram is probably my biggest. I'm trying threads. It's controversial. Okay. But, okay. Uh, yeah, Instagram, I'm raced with Sam. It's quite uh, a good one. Quite catchy. I changed yeah. it. It was very... I was a bit anti being found. And then I realised that actually it's important that people can see people like me so um as in joe blogs in the pit lane rather than a driver or engineer um i mm. think it's important that people can see that there's other jobs to make motorsport accessible you know you don't have to be super intelligent um you can work with your hands and still be successful so i yeah changed it so more people could find me mm. <laughs> That I, I often ask for like a profound message at the end uh, out to people that are listening. That that is a fantastic one. Um, you know, if you're not intelligent, then I wish I was unintelligent because I want to be able to get a job by just typing something on LinkedIn. But there we are. We'll find <laughs> out. I'll I'll, I'll, I'll I'll genuinely do it, and then we'll see. No, I won't do that. I probably damage my oh. career. Um, but there we are. <laughs> Um, well, it's been a real pleasure, Sam, and uh, we've barely scratched the surface on all sorts of topics we could have gone into. Uh, so thank you so much, and maybe we'll have you back at some point in the future. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been very relaxed and very enjoyable. Okay, brilliant. Well, that's the vibe we're going for, right? Uh, I don't know. We'll there'll be some. Re this won't happen, but like we could put some really angry um, background <laughs> music on and completely change the fit. No, we won't. We won't. But it'd be fine. But look, Sam, Slipknot. it's been a real pleasure. Sorry, go. <laughs> some Slipknot. Yeah, I mean, you could be Slipknot. We're both wearing hoodie, black hoodies with kind of like, you know, skulls on them. I don't know. I don't, I wasn't really, we called them Grebos or Grungers when I was growing up. I'm probably aging myself. No, I didn't, yeah, I didn't really know Slipknot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like I'm probably, I'm, you know, roughly the same era. You know, not quite, but there we are. Um, there we are. Uh, well, fantastic, Sam. And uh, those of you at home, you've made it to the end of the episode. So, that means, you know, it's free of charge. Give us a like, give us a five-star rating, give us a comment or a review, and drop us a line on on uh, on Twitter or on LinkedIn, maybe. We'll set up a LinkedIn, who knows? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, we, we, we will. We'll, we'll use Georgie's. Uh, or, or on Instagram, and we're at Strip the Dip. Um, but until next time, this has been your unusual co-host, F1 Blag. It's been fantastic to have you with us, Sam, and we'll see you soon. Goodbye.